Greetings. Welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and today, after a considerable delay, we're going to continue our examination of the combat career of the Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bomber in the Second World War. Last time, before the hiatus, we looked at the SBD's part in the smashing of the Japanese fleet base at Truk as part of Operation Hailstone. Today, we'll be looking at a lesser-known contribution of the type to the latter half of the Solomons campaign in the hands of the Royal New Zealand Air Force. As always, the sources used to prepare this video can be found in the description. So without any further delay, let's resume our survey. The use of units of dedicated dive bombers by the RNZAF was concretely envisioned in case number 200 of the Munitions Assignments Committee for Air, which was dated on 1st February 1943. This scenario was part of the planning for the projected Operation Elkton, a series of offensive moves in the Solomons and New Guinea, culminating in the invasion and capture of the Japanese base complex at Rabaul on the island of New Britain. The naval and air facilities here were the bastion of the Japanese strength in the southwest Pacific area, and its capture and neutralization was essential to Allied control of the region. New Zealand forces were among those slated to take part in this two-pronged offensive, including a substantial force of fighters and strike aircraft. However, this air contingent had yet to be raised. Lack of local production and the difficulty of sourcing British aircraft made supply from the Americans a logical option. So on April 21st, 1943, the British government, through its purchasing agency, requisitioned the aircraft to equip the New Zealand dive bomber component from the USAAF. The object of the request consisted of, quote, 120A-24 aircraft, complete and fully equipped, together with appropriate spare engines and engine spares, spare propellers and propeller spares, and corresponding provision of spares for all other items of equipment. The A-24 was the Army variant of the SBD, known as the Banshee in that service. These planes were to be shipped to the RNZAF in two batches of 60 each, for delivery in the third and fourth quarters of 1943, respectively. The requisition specified further that, quote, it is intended to retransfer the above-mentioned aircraft to the government of the Dominion of New Zealand. This request was received and confirmed by Army Air Force personnel, who noted that, quote, 120A-24s were assigned to the New Zealand government and are approved for long-range planning purposes. Production of these batches was undertaken at the Douglas plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which built the Banshee variants. However, choice of the Army version of the aircraft introduced a complication. The RNZAF units were intended to operate alongside U.S. Navy and Marine Corps formations, sharing their maintenance and logistical infrastructure. Thus, the A-24s would have to be built at Tulsa, then fly to the Air Force Technical Command at Wright Field to have some of the Army pattern equipment, chiefly oxygen and radio gear, as well as some instruments, swapped out with their naval counterparts. This would add a delay to the already short timetable for the aircraft's deployment in the theater, but it was considered that the planes could still make it there on time. Unfortunately, delays in production at the Tulsa plant, largely a result of the Army Air Force's lukewarm response to the A-24 and the dive bomber in general, soon made it apparent that the first batch of Banshees was very unlikely to reach the New Zealanders by the time they would be needed. In the event, the aircraft will be provided by a different sourcing arrangement, which we will describe shortly. With this other source of dive bombers secured, British request for the A-24s was cancelled on January 18th of 1944. Those Banshees, which had been modified with Navy gear at Wright Field, were reverted to the Army Standard, with the intention that they would probably be used as instrument trainers. The cancellation of this order coincided with the downsizing of the intended RNZAF dive bomber force. Of the six planned squadrons with this mission, two were eliminated altogether, while another pair, Numbers 30 and 31 were equipped with Avengers and trained to conduct more conventional glide bombing type attacks. Only number 25 and 26 squadrons would begin training on the Dauntless. Even of this remaining pair, one, number 26, would convert to the F4U Corsair before entering combat. This left the number 25 squadron alone to fly the Dauntless into battle in RNZAF colors. This reduction in the projected attack component reflected the change in strategic vision. The planned invasion and occupation of Rabaul, as laid out in the Elkton plan, was abandoned, and instead the base complex would be neutralized and bypassed, with the remaining Japanese garrison there left to wither on the vine. This plan, of which Operation Cartwheel would be the first part, required a lesser scale force. 
1943 continued and obstacles to the production of the Banshees continued to push back the delivery of the first batch of these planes. The chances of the New Zealanders being able to play their part in the move against Rabaul seemed smaller and smaller. Training the pilots on the aircraft and the techniques needed to take part in combat would take time, and it was imperative that it begin as soon as possible. Fortunately, a ready source was at hand in the form of the United States Marine Air Group 14, with elements resting and refitting in New Zealand at Seagrove near the city of Auckland. Not only were there surplus planes on hand here to enable New Zealanders to undertake their training, but they were already identical to the Marine and Navy planes that they would be operating alongside. And so the New Zealanders would receive their planes from this source. These initially came in the form of a loan of nine SBD-3 models. And so it was with these war-weary planes that 25 Squadron was established on the 31st of July 1943, with a personnel strength of 12 two-man air crews and a small number of maintenance specialists. Its commanding officer was Squadron Leader Theo McLean DeLang, then 29 years old. This Indian-born officer had compiled the RNZAF's manual for Army Cooperation Operations while serving at the Central Group HQ Army Corps. More recently, he served in the Pacific Ferry Command, before his posting to Seagrove. Squadron adopted a crest depicting a bird known as the Caspian Tern in a dive, holding a bomb in its claws. And it also took as its motto the Maori phrase Kia Kua, translating to constant endeavor. Associated Maintenance Unit, designated the number 25 servicing unit, consisting of three flights, was established later in October. The initial batch of Dash 3s had seen a good deal of action and were not in the best condition. They were rumored to be veterans of Coral Sea in the initial battles for Guadalcanal. In fact, it took a week for just one of the machines to be restored to an airworthy condition. These old planes would remain a maintenance nightmare while they were in the squadron's hands, averaging a serviceability rate of just 40%. The Marines provided assistance in the form of spare parts, but even so, the squadron would struggle to have more than three or four planes operational in the first weeks of its existence. In August, a Marine instructor, Master Sergeant W. W. Carmichael, was attached to the squadron, and four more Dash 3s were also provided this month. In September, a further five planes, Dash 4 models this time, brought the squadron up to its established strength of 18 Dauntlesses. In addition, a pair of Harvards were obtained to use in instrument training. An export variant of the North American T-6 Texan to place advanced trainer, Harvard was used in the air services of the British Commonwealth. The SBD-3s were first assigned temporary serial numbers in the NZ-200 range, but later on all New Zealand SBDs would be given numbers in the NZ-5000 range. As a result of this, the initial Dash 3s carried two RNZAF serial numbers, as well as their previous U.S. Navy identifiers. The aircraft would retain their U.S. paint schemes and carry U.S. markings until mid-September, when they would be repainted in similar colors and given the blue-white-blue blue roundels of the RNZAF. Following RAF practice at the time, the roundels on the fuselage sides were given a thin yellow outer ring. The majority of the pilots assigned to the new squadron were drawn from the Army Cooperation and Anti-Aircraft Units, while the backseaters were trained as wireless operators slash air gunner personnel. Their training followed the regular course for RNZAF personnel, with classroom study of tactics, bombing and gunnery, signals, intelligence, plane and ship recognition, meteorology, and similar classroom subjects. There was also a two-stage course of flight training, consisting of conversion training to the SBD, followed by instruction in the technique of dive bombing. Conversion training was made up of six hours of flight with an instructor in the back seat, and 16 hours with the student flying solo, 10 hours flown on instruments. Owing to the poor visibility forward from the Dauntless's rear cockpit, the Harvards were used for that portion of instrument training that had to be flown with an instructor on board. The dive bombing technique was based on the current marine practice but with some differences in detail. The method was as follows. The approach to the target would be made at 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters, by nine planes in three three-plane VICs, a V of Vs. The target would be approached slightly to one side. When the dive bomber drew abreast of the target, the dive flaps were opened and the plane rolled over into a vertical dive, with the pilot using ailerons to aim the nose at the target. Though the plane would be vertical in orientation, the lifting force of the wings, combined with the plane's forward momentum and the winds, meant that the actual diving angle was between 70 and 75 degrees. The speed in the dive was held in the range of 240 to 280 knots indicated, and the bomb load released at the comparatively high altitude of 2,500 feet, 750 meters. 
This was followed by a pullout and escape maneuvers to exit the area of enemy air defense. During training, spacing between aircraft and the dive was begun at 400 yards, or 365 meters. But as familiarity with the plane and skill and technique was developed, this interval was made much shorter. In addition to this kind of attack, 25 Squadron also practiced glide bombing and a 45 degree dive, as well as low level attacks for use against submarines. The pilots started practice on a stationary target and then progressed to moving ones, and dry bombing runs were succeeded by the use of small practice bombs and finally full-size live ordnance. This continued until the end of the year, when the squadron was ready to move on to operational training, which was to be conducted at Palakulo Airfield on the island of Espiritu Santu in the New Hebrides. During their time at Seagrove, the student pilots accumulated an average of somewhere between 100 and 200 hours on the SBD, and the backseat or somewhat less, between 60 and 120 hours. During this time, the entire squadron was re-equipped with the Dash 4 model, the older Dash 3s were gradually discarded and sent to storage depots at Hobsonville, where they would sit out the rest of the war. As the flight crews came close to the end of their training, preparations began for their next move towards the combat zone. On the 7th of December, A and B flights of 25 servicing unit departed New Zealand aboard the U.S. Navy transport vessel USS Octans. They arrived at the RNZAF base depot on Espiritu Santo on the 12th and took over a batch of SBD-4s intended for the squadron's use once on this island. Like the planes used at Seagrove, these were ex-marine planes and had seen better days. Sea Flight was left at Seagrove to support the squadron's remaining operations and to ready the planes there for use in training the next batch of aircrew. Training of 25 Squadron at Seagrove was finished shortly after the new year. On the 6th of January, 1944, 25 Squadron commemorated the occasion with a flight of all their aircraft, 18 SBDs in all, over the city of Auckland. The Big V formation of Dauntlesses was said to be the largest group of combat planes to be seen over New Zealand's territory up until that time. At the end of the month, the aircrew left Seagrove and headed for their new base at Palakulo. They arrived there on the 30th, flying in Dakotas operated by 40 Squadron. They were joined by the remaining flight of the servicing unit. Here they engaged in operational training, learning the methods that had been worked out by the Americans over the past two years of combat against the Japanese. The handling and organization of large formations of aircraft and the particulars of working in tropical conditions were emphasized. At the end of January, 25 Squadron joined in with the Marine and Navy flyers they would soon serve alongside for the final phase of their training. Several large practice strikes were flown along with American planes, as well as the Avengers of 30 Squadron, which was also undergoing operational training on Santo, complete with fighter cover provided by various marine units. On February 11th, they at last received the planes they were to take into combat. These were 24 brand new SBD-5s. By the 25th, these had been repainted in RNZAF livery, similar to that on the previous Dash 4s, but with the addition of white bars to the roundels. Some had nose art applied at this time as well. And a little over a month later, they completed their training and were ready to take their place in the line of battle. They would be part of Com Air Sols, the Solomon's Island Air Command, alongside their compatriots in 30 Squadron and three American units, VB-305 and VC-40 from the Navy and VMSB-235 from the Marine Corps. The ground personnel had once again been sent ahead by sea. The convoy in which they, along with their counterparts of 30 servicing unit, sailed reached Bougainville by way of Guadalcanal, entering Empress Augusta Bay on the 15th of March. The men went ashore on amphibious landing craft and were taken in these craft to the site of their soon-to-be camp, located in the area assigned to Marine Air Group 24. This proved to be within about 1,000 yards or 915 meters of the front line. Japanese troops were still fighting on Bougainville, and an offensive against the Allied perimeter had been underway for the last two weeks. The initial thrust had been blunted, but the Allies were still beset by Japanese troops in the immediate vicinity of the perimeter defense. They were often shelled by Japanese guns, or even harassed by small arms fire. Given these circumstances, the men of the servicing units were organized into combat platoons on arrival and assigned positions in the third line of defense in case the need should arise to repulse the Japanese breakthrough. Much effort in the first week was devoted to digging foxholes and constructing other defensive works, in addition to their more regular duties of unloading equipment and preparing the camp for the arrival of the rest of the squadron. On the morning of the 22nd of March, 25 Squadron took off from Palakulo, headed for Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, in two nine-plane formations. They were accompanied by four Venturas from 9 Squadron 
and a Dakota from 40 Squadron. The flight was uneventful, but one SVD, NZ-5055, which was flown by Flying Officer B.N. Graham, was written off in a landing accident, and the plane swerved off the runway and struck an oil drum. The rest of the part of the next day at noon for their final destination, the airstrip of Piva, on the shores of Empress Augusta Bay. Shelling of the field on the night of their arrival was a striking indication of the nature of the war they now found themselves in. The squadron's first operational sortie was flown at 6.15 the next morning, when the squadron leader, McLean DeLang, took off in his dauntless to spot for friendly artillery engaged in counter-battery fires against Japanese gun positions. This was the first of half a dozen such spotting missions 25 Squadron would record in the next three days. He also used the opportunity to scout out the area and familiarize himself with how things looked from the air. At this point in the Solomon's campaign, enemy fighter opposition was very rarely encountered, but the flak was relatively heavy. Almost all of this was from small arms and the lighter caliber automatic anti-aircraft weapons. However, the close proximity of the Japanese positions to the airfield made takeoff and landing extraordinarily hazardous for the SBD crews during the first days after their arrival. The New Zealanders found little safety even within the protection of the perimeter defense, as was noted in the squadron's operation record, quoting, The continuous shelling, particularly at night, and the noise of the return fire from our own guns prevented adequate sleep and rest. The shelling of the camp area and the revetments while warming up and taxing out for takeoff was another mental hazard. This rather understates the matter, I suspect, as the sleep and mental tranquility of the personnel involved were hardly the only things exposed to this kind of hazard. The squadron flew their first proper dive bombing sorties the first morning as well. Four 25 squadron Dauntlesses joined a dozen of the U.S. Navy counterparts from VB-305 to hit Japanese supply dumps at Tavera, southwards along the coast from Cape Torokina. The bombers plastered the area with 14 1,000 pounders, causing fires on the ground with a heavy column of black smoke marking the stricken enemy positions, rising up behind the SBDs as they headed back into friendly territory. Later that day, the squadron put up 12 planes to join in another strike with the Navy bombers. This time, the New Zealanders were accompanied by 14 Navy SBDs, again from VB-305, as well as a small number of Avengers. The target was another supply depot located just each of Camo Hill, positioned overlooking the northern sector of the perimeter defense. An infantry officer from the 1st Fijian Battalion, part of the Fiji Defense Force, which was the territorial unit under New Zealand command, was flying along with the U.S. Navy SBD leading the combined formation. This man, a Lieutenant Vigors, was intimately familiar with the terrain in the target area, having been in action on the ground there just before. Guided by his first-hand knowledge, the Dauntless has smashed the Japanese positions with 24 1,000-pound bombs, causing havoc on the ground. Surveying the aftermath of this rain of high explosives, the Fijian officer pronounced the results of the strike as fully satisfactory. In total, 25 Squadron flew 19 sorties on the first day after their arrival in Bougainville. 14 sorties of similar character were flown the next day against targets near the perimeter of the airfield, as the Japanese pressure was gradually beaten back. Working with the Avengers of 30 Squadron, which were also based at Piva, the Dauntlesses attacked gun positions and concentrations of enemy troops and were credited with two direct hits on enemy artillery. So close were the enemy positions targeted that ground personnel on the airstrip could easily observe the attack runs and even see the bombs falling from the dive bombers. News later came that one of their strikes had resulted in the death of the Japanese officer in command of their forces on the island. This officer was a colonel, and after death he was subsequently promoted to general. In all, 25 Squadron had flown 56 sorties of all kinds in their first two days on Bougainville. It was on the third day that they would begin to tackle the target they had originally been intended to attack, a concentration of Japanese forces around the naval base complex at Rabaul, the island of New Britain, and associated targets on that and other nearby islands. Most raids would focus either on targets near Simpson Harbor or Havana Canal Airfield, which is just south of Rabaul itself. This airstrip and the one at Tubera, which were the most rapidly prepared by the Japanese, were the most commonly attacked. Each day, 25 Squadron was expected to have 12 planes and crews on hand to contribute to this effort. Despite having an average total of only 15 planes during this time, they were able to meet this obligation every day except for one. Typically, the SBDs would act in a flak suppression role as part of a strike package consisting of themselves and a formation of Avengers. Precision bombing and low-level strafing attacks were employed to knock out or suppress Japanese air defense, clearing the way for the Avengers, 
who would immediately follow up with glide bombing attacks on the airfield itself. In this respect, their tactics reflected those worked out by the U.S. Marine Corps and Navy flyers in the course of the struggle up the Solomon's chain over the preceding two years. Targets were usually, but not always, airfields. These were ball missions followed a standard pattern. Strike planes would leave in the early morning hours and form up for the four-hour flight to the target. Some fighter escort was often provided, but the lack of Japanese aerial opposition in the area meant that this was not always present. The Dauntlesses were armed with a 500 or 1,000 pound bomb, with the fuse usually set for instantaneous detonation, but sometimes a short delay setting was used. Supplementing this, two 100 pounders were carried on the wing mounts, and these smaller bombs always carried an instantaneous fuse. In some cases, 250 pound bombs were carried on the wing racks instead. The aircraft would cruise at 14,000 feet, or 4,300 meters, in a diamond pattern of four plane elements. An approach to the target would begin with a descent to 9,000 feet, or 2,700 meters, at a speed of 270 knots. Over the target, the SBDs would pick out the defenses and go into their attack dives, releasing weapons at 2,000 feet, or 600 meters, and pulling out at 1,000 feet, or 300 meters. They would then carry out strafing runs to keep the defenders' heads down as the Avengers came in and attacked. Escorting fighters would usually join them in these strafing attacks if they were present. Sometimes the SBDs used shallower glide bombing attacks, with the payload released to 1,500 feet or 450 meters. This method was disliked by the crews, who thought it put them in an unnecessary danger, but it was resorted to when conditions dictated, usually as a result of weather. The strikes against the Rabaul area began with a mission against the Japanese airstrip at Kavyang, on the northern tip of the island of New Ireland. American troops had landed just before on Emirau, 120 kilometers away, and the attack was aimed at preventing the field's use by Japanese air reinforcements being staged in from bases further north. To enhance their deadliness against anti-aircraft gun crews, the SBDs were armed with anti-personnel cluster munitions, in addition to the 1,000-pound bomb on this raid. These took the form of two 120-pound or 54-kilogram fragmentation clusters, placing the small bombs usually carried on the wing racks. The 12 SBDs from 25 Squadron were part of a total force of 54 dive bombers from bases on Bougainville, joined en route by another dozen flying from Green Island. 24 Avengers, some of which were drawn from 30 Squadron, were also assigned to this raid. The original mission target was obscured by heavy clouds, and so Raluana, an alternate, was battered by 41 heavy bomb hits, demolishing a large number of buildings and igniting five distinct fires on the ground. Installations nearby on the shore of Caravia Bay were also hit. However, not all of 25 Squadron's crews were out of danger when the planes left the target area. Two of the planes, piloted by Flight Sergeant L.H. Jolly and Sergeant P.R.B. Simmons, were unable to bomb due to failures of their bomb release gear. Both planes had cluster bombs still aboard, one still carrying both and the other with just one still on the rack. The shock of landing shook them loose and set off the M110 fuses on the submunitions. They detonated on impact with the runway, totally destroying both planes and setting them on fire. Of the four crewmen, three were badly burned in the resulting blaze, with only Flight Sergeant Jolly escaping unharmed. This would be the only time the squadron's SBDs carried cluster munitions. Despite this regrettable incident, the New Zealanders put 12 planes up the next day. They flew as part of a 48-plane force against the gun emplacements near Vanakanao Airfield. Low cloud hung over the target area, and some crews were unable to find suitable targets. These proceeded instead to the alternative target at nearby Tibera, where they reported at least one direct hit on an artillery target there. In addition to their work against Raval, missions continued against the stubborn Japanese forces still in the field on Bougainville. Targets such as supply dumps and gun positions, as well as bridges, were hit. Barges were used to run supplies into the Japanese during the hours of darkness, and were then laid up in places of concealment during the day, these were pounded by the SBDs as well when they were located. In addition, the dive bombers flew in a close support role in conjunction with American and Australian ground forces, smashing bombs down on points of stubborn resistance. A very high sortie rate was maintained by 25 Squadron throughout their deployment on Bougainville, despite the harsh conditions imposed by nature and enemy opposition. In addition, the duration of the squadron's tour of duty, originally set as six weeks like that of their American counterparts, was extended to more than eight weeks. This was partly due to the decision to cancel the deployment of the intended follow-on dive bomber squadron, 
26 squadron. The decision to postpone this squadron's formation was taken on November 13th, and it was canceled altogether not long afterwards, despite the fact that the crewmen intended for it were already undergoing training in the United States as part of a U.S. Navy squadron. This decision was taken due to, quote, the decreasing importance of dive bombers in the Pacific area, and it was held that, quoting again, the operation of too many diverse types of aircraft in the RNZAF was undesirable. This was in line with the thinking of the United States Army Air Force in the case of the A-24 and other similar types like the A-25 and the A-35. In truth, at the time when the specialized dive bomber could be a viable weapon was running out, and the fighter bomber types available in 1944 were more than capable of dive bombing in addition to their other uses. Despite the long tour of duty, the RNZAF squadron was able to maintain a per capita rate of operational sorties, which was double that of similar American units, even with the generally shorter periods of deployment of the latter. That they were able to keep up this operational pace, despite the difficult conditions of the theater and the accumulating fatigue on both men and machines, is a testament to the hard work and ingenuity of the men of 25 servicing units some of whom had gained considerable experience working on American SPDs prior to their time with the squadron. Maintenance practice was informed by American experience, but the personnel roles reflected British methods. Ron A. Sutherland, who was serving with 25 servicing unit, described the prevailing arrangements, quote, In general practice, the same pilot and gunner slash wireless operator flew their own planes. An engine fitter and a rigger took care of the allotted aircraft. An armorer looked after three aircraft, and instrument makers had several. They were almost always in the same group, so this made for a great deal of team spirit. The same officer records the following, which sheds some light on the differences in maintenance practice between the New Zealanders and the Americans. Quote, On one occasion, one of our neighboring American mechanics questioned why we had the cowls off of our aircraft so often. We explained that we were simply doing routine daily inspection or 30 or 60 hour checks. He informed us that the Americans only took their cowls off their SBDs if the pilot had reported something on the maintenance sheet. Perhaps there was something in the old adage that she flew in so she'll fly out. This latter remark seems to downplay the importance of the more painstaking maintenance routines of the RNZAF. The operations record of the unit itself seems to agree. and puts this exceptional performance down to two factors unrelated to servicing. In its words, these were, quote, 1. Lack of sufficient aircraft in the area enforced the use of all available therefore requiring the squadron to provide 12 planes daily. And number two, the fact that fighter opposition was practically negligible. Previously, the strikes were governed mainly by weather. Then, if the weather between base and target was at all doubtful, strikes were canceled or returned to base, the reason being that their own fighter cover was unable to keep track of the bombers when flying through clouds, and so were unable to provide sufficient protection. With the falling off of fighter opposition, weather became a secondary consideration, and only a solid front between the base and the target area prevented a strike from reaching its primary target. No doubt these were important factors in maintaining high sortie rates, but it seems these would also apply to American units, and therefore do little to explain the comparatively high rate of sorties as compared to the American squadrons. Other factors must explain this difference, and it seems that the comparatively better maintained aircraft of 25 squadron would be a likely contributor. However this may be, the squadron was in action nearly every day from their arrival in theater until the 17th of May, when they would fly their last combat mission as a dive bomber squadron. This was another strike against the Rabaul area. Six of their SBDs joined 29 American planes for a raid on Lakanai Airfield. Here they found barges in the Simpson River, which were apparently carrying oil, and struck these. A few days later, on the 20th, the squadron departed Piva for the last time with 16 Dauntlesses taking off for Renard Field in the Russell Islands, the first stage of their flight back home. It was here that the SBDs were turned back over to the Americans. They had accumulated an average of 120 hours of combat flight time while in the hands of the RNZAF. Nevertheless, most of these planes were returned in such good condition that the American officer taking delivery of them remarked that they were practically brand new. It's another indication of the excellence of the New Zealand maintenance practice. Not all were in such good shape, however. One plane, NZ 5056, was noted as being returned with extensive flak damage. These planes were all reabsorbed into the U.S. Marine Corps. The next day, the crews were flown back to New Zealand in two Dakotas from 40 Squadron, landing at Wanuapai. Here, 25 Squadron was disbanded on June 19th. On October 30th, it was reformed at Ardmore, this time as a fighter squadron flying the Corsair. 
In the period of their deployment on Bougainville, 25 Squadron recorded 1,743.25 hours of operational flying time, flying missions on 49 days between March 24th and May 17, 1944. These included 56 strike missions of all kinds, as well as artillery spotting and other miscellaneous actions. Ordnance expended included 258.8 tons of bombs and more than 325,000 rounds of machine gun ammunition. Their serviceability rate was 94.4%, and their availability rate, 99.9%. Following stats were recorded regarding the general scale of their attacks. 18 confirmed direct hits, 30 direct hits reported but not confirmed, 7 confirmed damaging hits, 6 damaging hits reported but not confirmed, 252 bomb hits in target areas, 106 bombs dropped, the results of which were not observed, and 46 cases of bombs hanging up on the release gear. The effectiveness of the SBDs against enemy gun positions can be illustrated by the following more specific information. In their missions against Rabaul between mid-March and mid-May, 25 Squadron was credited with the following artillery targets destroyed. Four 5-inch or 127mm naval guns, four 4.2-inch or 105mm pieces, 16 of 3-inch or 76mm caliber, as well as 16 weapons classified as automatic and 42 more classed as light. An additional evidence of their effect can be seen in four reported instances in which heavier gun batteries were seen to be recited in closer proximity to one another. This was done to enable the sharing of fire control equipment, implying the loss of such necessary devices as rangefinders as well as altitude measuring and optical gear. Two batteries of naval guns on the islands were deprived of their entire fire control system. To put against this record, 25 Squadron lost two aircraft with their crews in combat. These were NZ-5050, crewed by Pilot Officer Jeffrey Cray and Warrant Officer Frank Bell, and NZ-5051, crewed by Flying Officer Jack Edwards and Flight Sergeant Hopp, both lost over Rabaul on the 10th of May. Another, NZ-211, was lost along with its crew in a fatal training accident at Seagrove on September 13, 1943. Its plane, flown by Pilot Officer William McJanet and Sergeant Dennis Cairns, crashed as a result of a stall at low altitude while near Waiuku, just south of the airfield. Three more were written off due to damage received on operations. These were 5054 and 5059, the two SBDs mentioned before that were destroyed by their cluster munitions on landing at Piva, and 5058, which was badly damaged over a ball on April 17. Another, 5055, was damaged on landing at Henderson Field during the move from Santo to Bougainville. Finally, two more planes went missing. 5037, flown by Flying Officer Alexander Moore and Flight Sergeant John Monroe, disappeared on a training flight while the squadron was at Espiritu Santo on February 11th. And a Dauntless, which never received a New Zealand serial number, which was lost along with Flying Officer McClellan Simmons on a ferry flight, although I could not find a date or any other information about this loss. 5037 was eventually found, but not until 1987. The remains of the airframe were sent back to New Zealand, and until recently displayed at the RNZAF Museum at Christchurch. In the words of the RNZAF historian Cliff Jenks, writing 30 years afterwards, the dive bomber was a, quote, successful failure in the nation's service. Their SBDs were too few and arrived too late in the New Zealanders' hands to make a lasting impression on the course of the Solomons' campaign. But those that did see action were fully equal to their American partners, played their role in the reduction of the last Japanese bastions in the Solomons area with skill, courage, and panache. And that brings us to the end of this video. Along with the previous episodes concerning Operation Hailstone and the operations of the Dauntless units in the New Guinea campaign, this also wraps up the coverage of the Southwest Pacific campaign. Next in the SBD series, I'll begin with the parallel thrust across the Central Pacific, culminating in the meetup of the two drives in the Philippines. The next video I put out, however, will be in the Brewster Buffalo series. This will begin the story of another chapter in the combat career of this much maligned aircraft, its role in the defense of Malaya and Singapore. Thus one episode featuring airmen of the British Commonwealth flying an American aircraft against the Japanese will be followed by another. That being said, till next time, I remain Mark 7, wishing you all the best.